Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome once more to a discovery evening with Wildlife Worldwide and the Travelling Naturalist. Uh, we're very, very pleased this evening to have the wonderful Alex Hyde with us, uh, and he's going to be providing a wonderful presentation on a trip that uh, looks just fabulous. And I have to say, Alex, it's a trip that I wouldn't mind joining myself one of these days, uh, and that's to uh, um, uh, go to Austria and have a, uh, an experience that will be close up on alpine nature. Uh, and that's what this evening's presentation is all about. Um, I'll let Alex introduce himself just shortly. Um, but just to let you know uh, who, who I am, I'm Nick, I'm Nick Joins, one of the directors here, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. So I will just do a brief introduction to what this evening is all about. Uh, and then I'll wrap up at the end with any questions that you would like to put to Alex uh, on the presentation about the trip and also about uh, the world of macro photography. Uh, if you are not familiar, and I'm sure that you are all familiar with it all by now, but there's two ways that you can send questions to us. One of those ways is to send us questions via the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen if you're looking at this on a PC, or it's the top of your screen, I think, if you're looking at this on a mobile device. Um, another way is to send us questions via the chat function which you can access in exactly the same way. So do please send us through your questions. We can answer those uh, at the end and just drip them through to us throughout the whole presentation. I'll be monitoring all of those that come in. And as I say, I'll put them through to Alex at the very end of his presentation. Um, towards the end, we'll also be wanting to ask you one or two questions. So we'll be running a poll at the end, just so that you can tell us what you thought of the presentation. Uh, and um, and then we'll be finishing up in about one hour's time. So Alex's presentation is about 40 minutes and then we'll have 10 or 15 minutes for uh, any questions that you might have at the end. We're not expecting uh, any technical issues, but I have to say that last time we uh, did a uh, presentation with Alex, which I hosted, uh, it was it wasn't quite as hot as it is at the moment. I don't know what the weather's like where uh, where all of the uh, uh, um, uh, attendees are for this particular uh, evening. But here in Hampshire, it is blistering hot uh, and we're due thunderstorms tonight. And last time we did a presentation, Alex, you'll remember that you were having the thunderstorms and it actually blew your internet out uh, towards the end of the presentation. So let's hope that doesn't happen this evening, please. Yeah, um, well, thanks for that, Nick. Uh, the thunderstorm has been and gone, so... <laughs> Good. We're, we're okay with that one. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming along to join us this evening. Um, and yes, it's going to be my great pleasure to introduce you to what I love about the Austrian Alps as a wildlife photographer. Here's a typical scene that you might encounter in the Austrian Alps in June, um, an ancient hay meadow a dilapidated hay barn and for me there's no happier place on the planet really I, I could spend weeks months wandering around such a place and you never run out of subjects the fact that the area I'm particularly interested in in Austria is at elevation means that the flora and fauna train changes dramatically as you head up the mountain slope so in the background there you'll see some snowy peaks this is in June but as you descend down in altitude here you're met with a, a carpet of fragrant orchids and further down still um, there's even more insect life so it's my happy place, Austria, and it goes right back to the beginning for me. Here's a, an old picture of my dad carrying me asleep on his back. At, I think I was about six months old there. And um, my parents, as when I was a child, took, took me to these particular meadows quite frequently. And it really got my interest in natural history going. And I really think it was probably about 20 years ago when I, I really got into the photography there. That's when I took this picture of some marmots. I remember 
I just about managed to scrape together enough for a camera with a bit of a telephoto lens and I took great pleasure in waiting next to this burrow entrance in the evening for all the marmots um, to just finish off their activities before going to bed and um, here is a mother with all the bedding to take down for the young. And I thought, I love this, you know, I'm, I'm spending all this time outside making first hand obs observations of nature. And from that point on, it was always my hope that I might um, involve that in my future career. And since then, I've been very lucky and um, I've been working as a, a wildlife photographer ever since. These pictures are actually um, from me in the field. Over the last month, I've been working on a few insect based commissions um, with all the macro gear there. Um, in this instance, photographing the larva of an oil beetle, which is about half a millimeter in length. So it's remarkable what cameras can actually do these days. You know, we, we live at a very, very exciting time to be a photographer. We can reveal details that even 10 years ago would have been the stuff of dreams. Well, I hope you don't need this map to know where Austria is um, roughly, but there we go. And going in a bit closer, I've marked on the map of Austria Innsbruck, which is um, where the airport is that we usually fly into. And that red pin in the map is actually where the village of Fis is, which is where we operate from. It's a south facing slope um, covered in alpine meadows at about one and a half thousand meters. And even as you're flying in on the aeroplane, the fun starts and you see what you're in for. And it, it was probably um, also about 20 years ago that I made an acquaintance out in Austria who I've stayed in touch with ever since. Um, the, the whole village comes out to cut the hay meadows in June and it's what makes um, the whole meadow ecosystem tick. You know, sometimes people are cutting the meadows by hand and it's a really interesting and dynamic time to be there. Obviously, as a, a macro photographer, it can be a bit heartbreaking to see all of the orchids, etc., get cut down, but that's what um, keeps it as a rich grassland. Um, it's, a lot of the meadows are only cut once or twice a year and not improved with muck at all. And you know, you'll see this hive of activity, people like ants almost harvesting away all of the hay just as you're working out <laughs> which bits you want to photograph. And it was in such a situation I met this man, Andy. Uh, he's very definitely a, a quintessential Austrian with all of the um, humour that goes with it. It's great fun to be around. And, and he's also a wildlife photographer. And when I was basically still a boy, he he came up to me whilst I was photographing that marmot family you saw earlier and opened up a conversation in broken English. And um, every time I go out there now, we, we meet up with him because he actually owns the hotel that we stay in and he comes out with us for the days. Um, so there he is, really, really nice chap. And a typical encounter with Andy is usually quite exhausting. Um, we have to tone him down a bit on the tours actually, but um, last time I spent um, a 48 hour session with him, I think we, we managed about two hours sleep. So his regime was to get out, go and do these waterfalls and then head up into the mountains and photograph the Alpen Rose. And then it got to sunset and we were still shooting. Then he wanted to do the moonrise. And then we did moonlit shots of the landscape at night with 30 second exposures. Um, which was all very eerie and beautiful, but I was getting a bit tired. And then the glow worms came out and then we did the sunrise without going to bed. And we did some panoramas of the sunrise. And then he said, you've got to come and see these carnivorous plants. So we did some sun dew pictures. And after all that, I really needed a rest. And um, as you can tell, he's, he's quite an energizing character. And that's what I love about shooting um, pictures alongside other people. They definitely help me find my extra gear. Um, you kind of feed off each other's enthusiasm. And I've always found that to be the case um, with the groups we lead out in the field for wildlife worldwide. Um, certainly, once everybody's got to know each other after the first day, there's this great energy in the group for photography. Here are a few little scenes from the 
rich pine woodlands so just one of the habitats that I enjoy exploring with the camera because of course it does rain in the mountains and it provides an alternative um, arena to work in with the camera. I've always been fascinated with the slightly more understated subjects that you find so some resin dripping from a pine tree for instance this was just caught by some natural backlighting a very wide angle picture of some parasol mushrooms. So this was shot with a 16 mil lens right on the floor. And I used a Kit Kat wrapper, the silver foil of it to bounce a bit of light in underneath that toadstool. Otherwise we'd be looking at a silhouetted toadstool cap. I enjoy playing around with flash a great deal, um, a bit more on that later. But to give you an idea, this picture was shot in the middle of the day and what I've done here is instead expose for the much brighter flashlight. So we've dropped all of the ambient light out completely. We're not seeing any sunlight in this picture at all. That's all backlighting from off camera flash. On Monday, I visited a really interesting site down south called Ranscombe Farm as part of a commission I was working on. And it was a baking sunny day, as I'm sure you will all remember. And I actually find those conditions quite tough to work in, not just because I'm hot, but because subjects tend to look a little harsh and contrasty. So the blacks are very deep, the highlights are very bright, and there's precious little in the mid-tones where all the colour tends to reside. So this little diffusion umbrella is something I often take with me. It folds down very small, and you can see that pool of diffuse light I'm working in there. I was photographing some rare arable plants in this instance. But even if you don't have such a thing, you can just put your hand out and cast a little shadow on your subject. And I, anyone who's seen one of my talks before will be familiar with this slide, but it works so well to demonstrate the principle. Here are some flowers in bright sunlight and the whites are completely blown, the shadows are completely black. If we instead cast a shadow with our hand, you can now see we've got detail throughout the image. So this concept of softening your light is something um, that I use throughout my work. It's not that I'm allergic to sunshine and there are certain instances such as backlighting where it's just what I want. Um, but very often I'm looking for these shaded situations. Here's another little lighting conundrum for you. These are some wood ants that were feeding on the honeydew from the aphids they were farming on a, the, the stem of a scabious flower out in the meadows. And I'm looking up against the sky here because I like the blue sky, but that meant the ants were silhouetted. It wasn't going to work using a Kit Kat wrapper to bounce light in in this instance. There was too much of a contrast difference. So here I've improved the shot with a little bit of flash. I've just pumped in a tiny weak wash of flash enough to lift the ants out of silhouette, but leave the blue sky. So you get the best of both worlds there. I'm sure there's a few techies out there this evening. I certainly enjoy getting the most out of my photography by understanding what all the different lenses and pieces of equipment can do for me. I do think carrying a range of lenses is important. It's your creative eyes onto the world. So top left, we've got a classic um, wide angle zoom lens, 16 to 35. Um, down bottom left is the one I use the most, the 100 mil macro and various other options there. And then there's the non-lens side of things. Um, a tripod without a centre column, that really helps. It means I can get the legs right down to ground level by splaying them out. Um, getting the camera down very low is of course important with smaller subjects. I've put in a selection of images this evening that I hope not only show you some of the close-up details I'm particularly fond of, but where these creatures and plants grow. So you'll see these big scour lines here. And these are of course formed when a, a glacier passed over this piece of rock, polished it smooth, and the scrape lines are from rocks that were embedded in the bottom of the ice. The glacier is still visible there right at the back of the image, but it's receded a great deal since the ice age. This environment's very interesting for photography because it's very simple. And I think simplicity does lead to stronger compositions. Often when I'm framing something up, I think, what can I leave out of the picture? And very often, if I can still get the message across, but 
exclude something that that message is getting stronger and stronger every time I exclude another element. I'm quite fond of subjects being small in the frame too, and you should never be afraid of doing that. The rocks are covered in this particular lichen, um, often known as map lichen. Uh, it does really look like a page from an atlas. And it can be difficult when you've, you know, you've got on an aeroplane, you've paid your money for your trip, and you're all geared up with all your kit, it can be difficult to have the motivation to stop at something as straightforward as an area of flat lichen. But that's very much what we're about. Um, we hope that people will come back with a real ecosystem level analysis of where they've been, looking at the very smallest things all the way up to the um, scenery too. And it's one of these things with the group energy again, once one person gets started on it, suddenly everybody's um, paying attention. A little bit on the technical side. So I'm sure there's a huge range of photographic abilities out there this evening. And there's nothing wrong if you're a complete beginner. Um, I must say, it's a very exciting time to be a complete beginner. Photography is very accessible, all the online learning there. And I think the most important message you can take home from tonight, if you're kind of new to photography, is how you control your, the aperture of your camera. So on the right, we have a low F number, on the left, a high F number. And this is just controlling how much depth of field or depth of focus we have in the picture. There's just a thin slice down the front of this orchid in focus on the right. And that is a really creative decision that we have to take as a photographer. And you can see really it's um, the image on the right, the background is far less distracting, but maybe we can't see quite as much detail in the flower. So swings and roundabouts very often. For a scene like this, which was shot right up on the mountaintop, um, creeping azalea and a lichen, I, I wanted the complete texture to be in focus. So I've selected something around F20 here to do that, to get everything sharp. It wouldn't be the time to shoot with a shallow depth of field. Here, once again, I want to show this plant growing in its mountain habitat. So I've used a lot of depth of field to do that. I don't want a blurry background there. So going back to the rather more esoteric and bizarre subjects that you won't necessarily be forced to engage with if you travel with me, but I'll certainly encourage you heartily. Um, this is what's known as red snow, and it's actually formed by lots and lots of single celled algae individual cells in the snow that have a red pigment that protect, protect them from the UV. And they've got a flagella, so they can actually, or, or cilia actually, they, they can move up and down in the snow column because each little grain of ice has a little bit of water around it and they move through the snow by going through the liquid phase. And they can adjust their height in the snow um, depending on how intense the UV is. So various areas will be a very pale pink, others will be a deep red. And the area we're looking at here, by the way, is about probably five meters across. I really wanted to get an image showing these algal cells. So I got every single extension tube I could on my camera and managed to get this rather soft image, but it actually shows the individual algal cells in this um, phenomenon. And it's um, just a very interesting thing to observe out there in the field. Here's another wonderful moment high up in the mountains. It's where the spring thaws given way to summer and the snow is melting. And you'll see these curious little holes at the frontier of the melting snow here. These are alpine snowbells and they're melting through the snow. They're the first flowers to appear after the snows melt and they've actually expediated the melting in a couple of ways. The buds themselves are very dark before they open, so they radiate more heat and melt the surrounding area. But more remarkably, the buds actually ferment carbohydrates, generating a gentle little bit of heat that helps melt a little passage through the snow too. And just look at that simple little picture there, focusing down on the rim of petals as they emerge. The actual um, amount of interesting natural history in that picture based on what I've just told you about how they achieve that, that melting transforms the picture for me certainly and um, very often the caption is almost as beautiful as the image I find with nature photography. 
as I mentioned earlier, it's important to have a range of lenses with you. And, you know, just a, a metre to the left of the previous shot, I shot this image with a, a 16 mil lens to show the snow bells in their mountain habitat. On the right, you can just see a couple of winged green fly just out of focus a little further back to give you some scale. If you flip an alpine snow bell upside down, um, you see this beautiful kaleidoscope like pattern and the surrounding white is just the surrounding snow glinting away. So not an obvious image at all, um, but something you might risk taking once you've kind of bagged the insurance record shot that we all need to take when we see something new and moved on to maybe more creative avenues. I was very pleased with this image. It was one I'd had in my mind for a while and it's shot with a very shallow depth of field down at f2.8. And the bokeh here, the out of focus quality of the background um, is rendered with a series of overlapping circles, which you can achieve if you open your lens all the way up down to its lowest F number. So with this lens, that was F 2.8. It tends to give the best rounded circles um, if you want that effect. And the circles are actually glints of highlights of some melting snow in the background. It's a great time um, to experiment with your photography on um, this particular Austria trip because we're, we're pretty much a sort of go slow group. We revisit sites two or three times um, because we like to get to know them in all different lights, different times of the day. Usually the first time you visit um, an area of meadow, it's so overwhelming. You're just basically going around looking at all the different species and working out what it is you'd like to photograph. So it's only by returning a few times that you get into the really interesting photography. This is a six second exposure on a very still day showing a mountain stream whizzing past some flowers that are obviously fortunately not blowing in the breeze during that long exposure. Accessibility is always a consideration when putting a trip itinerary together. And I'll say a little more about that towards the end, but there's a very good cable car network um, at the base we stay at. And it's there solely because of the skiing season. But out of season in the summer, we get to enjoy uh, a free ride up the mountain in them. And it allows us to access higher sites that would take all day to walk to otherwise. One of the most iconic flowers you'll see in June in the mountains are the trumpet gentian. And you can see there's this, the blue of them is so saturated, it makes the mountain sky, which itself was very blue that day, look almost desaturated, such as the intensity. If you look inside these flowers, which will be growing happily at two and a half thousand meters, if not higher, you find there are various invertebrates that take refuge inside. So I check every single one and look down them. And for instance, in this one, a tiny crab spider awaiting a visiting pollinator that it'll be able to grasp and eat. Um, these don't spin a web, they just wait to ambush um, insects with their spined legs. A very simple picture just going right into the middle of some mountain arnica, um, one of the flowers that's often used medicinally in Austria, and a dianthus, a delicate little moment as the dews evaporating first thing in the morning. It is um, something to warn you about that we do like early mornings on these trips. So it tends to be that the light is quite harsh in the middle of the day. And obviously the, the more interesting light is right at the beginning and nearer the end. So we, we try to work towards those principles where we can. And most mornings there will be an option, if you like, to go out before breakfast, spend some time in the meadows, uh, look for roosting butterflies, look for dew all over the flowers. It's my favourite time of the day by far. Here's a plantain flower head, just looking straight down on it. And here's a, the same flower um, with a little compositional device I use from time to time. You'll see there's an out of focus repeat in the negative space in the background of this image. And you can see I've done that again here with this burnt tip orchid. It's a really useful idea for um, just filling in that um, extra space in the image, not too distracting, 
Um, you want to have relatively shallow depth of field to do this. And I tend to make them diagonally displaced. So you'll see the one in the back is diagonally up from it. That moves your eye diagonally through the picture, um, creating a bit more dynamism to it. This is the sort of pose you might expect to adopt in a field of orchids. Um, it's all, it all makes sense when you look through the lens. By shooting through vegetation, you create a soft halo around your image. So look at this amazing burnt tip orchid. That'll be very old because as they get older, they tend to get taller. Um, and it's really the orchids almost of secondary importance. It's that blur of meadow flowers we're shooting for that, through that makes the picture. A similar idea here. I mean, it's such a messy composition. Um, it's it was definitely the case that there were bits of grass actually obscuring the butterfly if I looked at my camera setup, but because I'm shooting with a very shallow depth of field, those have fallen out of focus and created a sort of warm haze in the image. And the focus is just on that butterfly, which itself is rather a tatty specimen, but that doesn't matter. That's what the chaos of the meadow feels like when you're in it. First thing in the morning, that deep blue behind the caterpillars backlit hairs is the distant mountains on the other side of the valley. Um, and it's very useful if you're shooting slightly downhill out across the valley, you always have this deep blue to work with because of course that is a, a north facing slope to the south facing one that our village is on. I enjoy hand holding a great deal when it's possible and um, I do find, you know, you plonk a tripod down and you'd be better be pretty sure of your ideas at that point, because once the camera is immobilized, it locks out a lot of your creative ideas. Tripods have their place and I use them for focus stacking a great deal for subjects such as lichens that aren't going in anywhere or static butterflies that are roosting. But when a subject's on the move, you really do have to hand hold. And I tend to use a technique whereby I will put the camera on shutter burst and take a little burst of four or five pictures, um, manually focused on where I think the eyes are. And just the natural movement of me and the subject during that shutter burst will ensure the focus is pushing back and forwards. And when I come to download that little sequence of four or five images, I can hopefully select one out where the focus has just chanced to be in exactly the right plane, in this case, over the eyes of this cricket. You see a bit of a theme here, these um, background images where the subject, yes, has its place, but it's all about the setting. Now, I, I do enjoy doing butterflies perched on orchids. I hasten to add these perched themselves here. I have not moved them there. Um, they were just happily mating away there. Um, so I thought it only reasonable to get three other people around them to photograph them that they didn't seem to mind. Um, but you know, once again, it's technically, it's a lovely picture, but you can have too much of a good thing. And the last thing I want to do when I'm somewhere like this is go away with hundreds of samey pictures. So hopefully we kind of get the perching butterfly thing out of our system so that we can look at other ways of portraying that scene. And this is the same butterflies in the previous shot, but going in with extension tubes on the macro lens to get more magnification and just look at a close-up of the wing section. Here's an unconventional view of an Apollo butterfly, but I really like it. You know, in an image set, it's a very valuable image because it gives you an intimate eye-level connection with the subject that is hard to achieve any other way. A close-up of an Apollo's wing spot. Um, each individual scale has actually got dew on it because um, it's first thing in the morning. And here is the Apollo in all its glory. I had to show you really. I mean, I, I can't think of any subject I'd be more excited to see in the Austrian Alps. And most years we find them. I mean, they very much um, depend on the weather conditions at the time. So you can never guarantee these things. But most years we find Apollos to photograph. And the key is to get there early in the morning when they've just emerged. Um, some will have actually emerged from their
chrysalis um, first thing and be airing their wings for the first time. Others will have been resting on a flower overnight. And one little trick with butterfly photography is go out the evening before, find where all the butterflies are resting on the grass heads or wherever, and they'll, they should still be there the next morning. So you can set your alarm nice and early, straight out of bed, pile into the car and go straight to where your butterflies are and set up without wasting time looking in the morning. Lying down below butterflies can be very interesting. So there you go. Natural backlighting. We can see a little um, drop of rain on the wing there. And here's a cunning device I make use of. Uh, a Wimberley clamp. You can see this extendable clamp system allows you to grasp a piece of vegetation and stop any movement um, that might spoil your picture. Uh, this had to be a tripod shot because I a, wanted reasonable depth of field in the subject, which unfortunately means you do have to have a longer shutter speed. And um, also, I wanted to just fine tune the composition and get that blob of yellow somewhere behind the moth's head. And there's no way that shot would have been possible without securing the top of the blade of grass to stop it moving around in the wind. Here's what it's all about then. First thing in the morning, uh, this is a false heath fritillary. The scabious flower on the left is actually touching the lens of my camera there. So it would look like a mistake if you actually saw somebody's camera set up at the time, but it's all about bringing this energy and creativity into your shots, trying to get away from the classic record pictures, hopefully. I'll just hop back. Um, there's a lovely swallowtail encountered on a, a similar morning. So there's so many different ways of going about macro photography. I, um, I'm like anyone else. If I see something interesting, I'd like a quick and reliable way of getting a picture of it um, that doesn't necessarily require hours of patience. This jumping spider's about half a centimetre in length. As its name suggests, it was jumping around. I needed a quick in-focus picture of it. And I did it like this, which might not look terribly simple, but I can assure you it is. What you're seeing there is not only my sunburnt centre parting, but a flash lead coming off my hot shoe on the camera, going to an off-camera flash. And that off-camera flash has a little diffuser on it. And so from the underside of that um, black diffuser that I'm holding, there's, a, there's an area of white transparent material and all the light is flooding out of that over the subject. I've created a little lighting zone right at the end of my lens. And the thing about that is that if I hop back, that light is really nice and bright, but it's got a nice diffuse quality from the diffuser. So it looks natural and it freezes any action in the picture. It'll freeze any handshake of mine. It'll freeze any movement in the spider. And you can basically turn the flash up in power until you have enough light to use whatever ISO if that means anything to you. ISO is higher quality if it's low, but uses a lot more light. And whatever f-stop you want to use to get however much depth of field you want. It, it feels like you're cheating almost because you can turn the light up effectively brighter than the available sunlight to achieve the results you want. I'm very interested in wide angle and fisheye lens photography um, to get creatures in their habitats. And you saw earlier there was um, various plants set in the, the alpine scenery. It works very well in the meadows too. This is a crab spider that's able to change the colour of, of its body to match the flower it's on so that it's perfectly hidden and it's able to grab pollinators as they land on the flower. It's, it can't change to every colour, but it can switch between yellow and white um, over a couple of days. And if you move one to a different flower, you will see that colour change take place. Sorry if you don't like spiders. Um, I forget that not everybody loves them. This is um, a raft spider known as Dolomedes, and they live in um, the boggy areas. And you can see that it's just standing on the meniscus of the water here. And these are actually able to catch um, small fish like stickleback straight out of the water. 
we're nearing the end of what I want to um, show you here, but I wanted to um, bring up this little sequence that um, has had some interest in the past. I've, I've certainly had a few questions about the technique. So focus stacking enables you to take a series of pictures at different focal points throughout the image and stitch the results together to get one final image with sharpness, possibly front to back, if that's what you're after. At any rate, taking the focus beyond that that you can achieve in a single frame. Now you can do it very methodically on a tripod with a focusing rail and you can gradually advance the focus from the very frontmost element all the way to the back. And you might take three pictures doing that, but you might take 200, it doesn't really matter, so long as the focus on those individual frames overlaps. And you can then stitch those images together in some very easy to use software that basically involves importing the images and pressing the stitch button. It's not too difficult. It's just a little time consuming. What I'm going to show you here, though, is a much more straightforward idea where these five burnt tip orchids were in a busy meadow environment. I wanted to get them all in focus. So I took this first picture focused on the closest one. This second picture focused on the one on the left. And this third one focused on the remaining two at the back. I then combined these images and cropped a little bit. And you can see this is the result. We've got all five orchids in focus. This was shot with a 500 millimeter lens that you might normally think of for bird photography, but actually made quite a suitable selection for um, this kind of shot because it, it gives good subject isolation. So you get the best of both worlds. You've got the blurry background of shooting maybe at f5.6 or something but you've got focus throughout the interesting bits of the subject. So it really gets you thinking when you start playing around with options like these. White background photography is very important in my commissioned work. Um, editors really like these images because you can put text right up to the subject. So they're useful for maybe leaflets that might be given out at nature reserves of species you could see. Um, and I quite enjoy producing them. And the essence is that you have to use a flash gun to do it. And that flash gun has to be off camera. There's a number of ways of getting your flash gun off camera. You could perhaps use one of the leads I showed you earlier. Um, radio triggers are more convenient because you don't have a trailing wire getting in the way. And some cameras actually now have the capability to fire off camera flashes all from their um, menu systems. What I've done here is place a simple piece of white A4 paper about a foot and a half behind this great green bush cricket. Um, out in the meadow, I've not picked this flower, I've not put the cricket there even, it was just there. And it's enabled me to produce this cutout image. And the key is that you direct the flash gun primarily onto the white background so that that blows out completely and becomes pure white. The spill from the flash can then be allowed to partially illuminate the subject in the foreground if you want to do it with one flash or as I've actually done here, I used a second flash to light the cricket independently. So it wasn't quite as bright, but you can see it allows us to see the detail in the antennae really nicely. I wouldn't want to photograph everything on a trip this way, but for a few cracking subjects, it can really make a difference. This has been done with an extreme level of diffusion. So this beetle is sitting on a piece of white paper and I have made a cylinder of white paper about the diameter of my lens, a little wider actually, and put that round the scene I want to photograph and fired just a single flash gun in through the side of that cylinder and the lights ricocheting around inside that cylinder of paper that the beetle's also in and it creates this lovely soft light. And you can see comparison here on the left, if we were to not diffuse our flash gun, that is what we would see on the right, you can see the diffuse version. Um, so generally I would prefer the situation on the right for what I'm doing. And it allows you to make these fun little montages. Um, these were all found in the same meadow on the same day, but you could have photographed these several years apart on different continents if you wanted. And it would have still been just as easy to squidge all of the images together because they've all got the same pure white background. 
and that's something you would have to do in Photoshop with layers um, as separate images and bring them all together into a final scene. So I've talked a lot about the subjects I like doing out there. Um, I certainly haven't covered them all. Uh, there's not time for that, but hopefully it's given you a taster. Here I am scowling, rather hot, um, I think, um, but I'm, I'm holding a diffuser up to cast some soft light over some orchids for one of the guests on, on the trip there. Um, here we go. So you see the sort of scene you're in. It seems these tilly hats are still all the, the rage. I, I certainly have one. You can usually spot um, groups quite easily with that. We don't make you wear them. It's just, just by chance a lot of people turn up with them. But to be out there in that environment, working away um, with your own space and your own time to think, knowing that you may well revisit one of these locations again if you don't quite get it right the first time, um, us on the hand to help as we go. Um, I usually run, I should have mentioned this earlier, I usually run these trips um, not only with my friend Andy who's out there but also my very good friend Nick Garbutt who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I think we first ran one together maybe eight years ago or something. And that's Nick there. And there's the hotel that we use. And you can see it really is set, not the shacks on the left, I hasten to add, the, the nice building right at the back. Um, you can see it's set right in amongst the meadows. So there's, there's subjects that you can wander out into the garden and shoot if you want. Um, you don't have to go far. And I thought I'd end with this reassuring reminder that um, the cable car system is very good there. I think there's a, at least five cable car networks um, spidering out from the village we're in, taking you up the mountain, across the mountain, down the mountain. We also have a couple of minibuses. So we tend to take you largely to the area we're going to work on um, so we can get straight into the photography. So thank you for listening. If you'd like to ask me any questions long run, you know, some other point in your life, do get in touch with me via social media. Um, however, if you've got any for this evening, it'd be very interesting to hear from you. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Alex, that was wonderful. Again, I, I was delighted to uh, um, be able to host the second presentation you've done for us, the first one was was wonderful. That was a couple of months ago, and I was um, I was uh, first to put my hand up when um, uh, Sue and Sally uh, said that you were doing a uh, an, another presentation, and um, that that was just wonderful. I'm I'm going to um, indulge you, or, and I hope that people don't mind if 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 I can indulge myself as well. Um, before um, we, we we start with some questions, so so while um, everybody, if you do have a question. If you can submit it to us now, then that would be great. Again, use the Q&A function um, in the, uh, in the uh, toolbar that's at the bottom of the meeting there, or use the chat function. And Alex, just while the questions um, continue to come in, I'm going to ask you to rewind to, to a couple of images that, that really stuck out for me. Uh, and um, one of them was that, uh, as you described it, that rather tatty looking specimen of, of the butterfly in that very, very busy meadow. I thought that that image was absolutely exquisite. Oh, bless you. Really, really beautiful image. And I, I think that you may have used it in the presentation that you did uh, for us a couple of months ago. Uh, th that is absolutely stunning. It's, it's the most beautiful image. It, 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 I, I, that's it, you know, I'm going to sell all my camera gear. Yeah, there, there, there's just no point in me, you know, in, in having to try and try and, and match it. It's, it's absolutely it's wonderful. It's very kind of you, Nick. It's very kind of you. And um, I'm pleased that you get the same joy from it that I definitely do. Um, it doesn't matter that it's a tatty butterfly. That, that if anything, that, that adds to it, if anything, doesn't it? It, it is nice to see nature as nature intended. And yeah, I suppose sometimes we're all guilty of being too formulaic with our photography yeah and um 
we've all seen occasions where things get over gardened mm. so people will obsess with the clean background that perhaps I don't know maybe it's it was trendy and for the camera club judge or whatever I don't know what would be motivating an individual to do that but um, you know, there's a time and a place for it. And I, I generally prefer to have the context there and, and to really not feel under time pressure as well. You know, this isn't the sort of image you could just turn up and take and leave. Oh, no, it's you've, got to, you've, got to, to you've got to be sort of lying there, haven't you, down yeah. in the meadow, looking for little windows through the plants, taking well, your time. What, what I particularly like about the image is, is that... Um, I mean, I, I've been looking at this now, you know, for, for you know, a, a couple of minutes or so, and uh, I'm sort of still looking for things within it. You know, down in the bottom left-hand corner, you've got the lovely flower. In the background, you've got grasses that are that, 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 that are being being blown about in the wind. You've got sort of it's it's just got everything. It's it's stunning, absolutely. It's like a beautiful oh. watercolor. You've got the busyness of the background, and you've got this tranquility of the stillness of of the uh, of, of, of the butterfly hanging the, on the flower it's it's really really beautiful well thank you and the, the watercolor quality that you talk about is solely because i'm i'm shooting through a lot of vegetation that isn't yeah. actually in focus as i think i described it it creates this sort of warm wash mm. this was right at sunset so the the grass i was shooting through was actually bathed in evening light so it's yeah. great this sort of nostalgic warm hovisy glow that's yeah. through the image yeah. um but i guess i should be honest like i haven't shown you all the ones from that sequence that didn't work <laughs> no, um, don't, don't, don't spoil it, don't spoil it. Don't there spoil were a lot it. there were a lot that didn't really work because there was a bit yeah. too much obscuring it but anyway you, you've yeah. got to you've got to try no, it's wonderful that it, it really struck out of me the other one that i particularly liked as well was 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 the first of that se or, or the second in that sequence of the snowbells where you were describing how they they actually melt the snow around them and and it, it, you know, a completely different photograph. But what I liked about what you were saying, um, you know, if you just stop and look, um, there's a whole in, there's an incredible story behind the most simple thing that you know we have all seen. Mm -hmm. you know, we've all seen holes, uh, you know, a, along the snow line there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I never knew that it was because of you know. The darkness, you know, of, of the flower tip that, mm -hmm. you know, being being black, it absorbs more heat. I wasn't aware of the carbon dioxide either. It's, you know, it's it's, it's a great image. It's a lovely image, but it's actually the story around the image that 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 is that is so impressive. And I think that's one of the probably the lovely things about the trip that you do is that, you know, as you say, you go slow and you absorb, you know, the the macro natural world that is at your feet. Yes, it, I mean that's the real treasure. It's knowing what your picture shows you know in detail yeah um and you usually find certain people will really want to focus on a certain type of subject it might be that butterflies are their thing or it might be that you know they're the one that really wants a picture like this of the snowbells and yeah. you know it can take a week to get that result sometime yeah. um so yes that's that's all part of having one base really yeah and then yeah. plenty of identification books with us too so it's undoubtedly yeah all that, undoubtedly. All that side of things yeah not only have you got a, a heavy bag of, of of camera equipment but you've got another heavy bag <laughs> of books <laughs> yeah, a few, yeah a few okay hey listen thank you alex um sorry everybody to uh to, to do that but i the, the, it was such a great presentation and, and the images are, are, are so powerful and um yeah really absorbing as well um, we do have a few questions, Alex, uh, and um, the, uh, the, the, they are, uh, as, as you'd expect, um, that they are about the equipment that you use as well. Um, and um, one of the questions we've got here is, what would you suggest is the most useful macro lens to buy? Um, ooh, I, I suppose something around the 100 millimeter focal length um yeah. be the most useful and if you can afford to pay the extra one with image stabilization yeah. so that can give you a lot more potential to hand hold the lens in low light and still not see any camera shake yeah. um, so my 100 mil lens you know 
if I had to save one one lens from the waves, as they say, that would be the one. Um, yeah, the one. Okay. Mm. And, w and w would you would you say that that would be a good starter macro lens as well? Yeah. There's, yeah. there's lots of questions about starting. You know, get, yes. Starting out in this. It, yeah. it would be, and don't don't overlook the second hand market for lenses because so long as the optics aren't marked, um, you know, they're good to use and. I, I buy quite a few lenses secondhand, um, and it's usually quite a benefit if somebody's put a dint on the outside of it somewhere or scratched the paint. That could take a yeah. hundred quid off the price for you. So, I um, yeah, I would I would look at those sort of options. Um, yeah. But you know, a macro lens does a lot more than close up pictures. I I use it as a lovely fast portrait lens indoors for taking pictures of my kids. Um, I use it to do landscape pictures you know it can still focus to infinity yep. it's, just, it's got this extra ability to focus very close so most lenses will close focus maybe to about a meter away yeah whereas you could probably get the front of a macro lens to maybe within about 15 centimeters of something quite commonly yeah uh, and even closer still if you put extension tubes on so right. it's that close approach that's giving you the magnification yeah yeah um, just a quick question um, from, from David on, on the uh, jumping spiders. He says those spiders, they're, they're, well, I know for one that they're, they're, they're tiny. How, how did you spot it in the first place? But that, that's from me. Um, but from David, um, you know, those spiders, he says, you know, they move like lightning. How on earth did you, did you manage to keep it still? Well, indeed, you can't keep a jumping spider still. <laughs> um, so I suppose it's about finding one that's maybe not on the move um which is difficult because usually we see a jumping spider because it's flitting around you know because it's bouncing around and to be honest if i was to try and get that shot of you know middle of the day on a baked rock this spider that's full of beans bouncing around i'm unlikely to manage it but i actually remember that was done quite early in the morning that one and yeah. and time and time again that's the way to get good invertebrate shots shoot them when they're cool um because in hot weather you're you're fighting a losing battle having said that some jumping spiders some particular species are so interested in their own reflection in the front of the lens that they will come and look at that reflection and think really? it's another spider and i've had male spiders displaying at what they think is another male in the front of the lens wow. i mean it's, and that obviously makes for a pretty good picture yeah um yeah. so you know to, they've got wonderful visual acuity um jumping spiders to give you an idea there was a a japanese paper where they'd actually made tiny televisions for jumping spiders to watch images of spiders of the opposite sex on and they were able to <laughs> watch these tiny televisions um i can't remember what the results were but i loved the study yeah that sounds great mm. um a, a, another technical question what flash gun do you use alex uh, I use a, a range. Um, I've got one, as I shoot on Canon generally, um, the one I tend to use is the Canon 600 RT. RT um, in the name means it's radio triggered, but Canon have a number that are RT, if you like. Um, I think they've moved on to the 660 model now, which for some reason costs a lot, a lot more, but right. don't no need to spend loads on a nice shiny flash you can see where this is going i got all mine second hand with lots of scratches on and they're just fine because as a macro photographer your kit does tend to get a bit scruffy because you're putting it on the ground the whole time and all that business um but a very simple flash will do um you don't need to get a dedicated canon one for instance you could get a third party one the main thing is that you can get it off camera and you yeah. can do that with the curly wire that goes from the hot shoe to the flash, or you could do it with a radio trigger system. Very good. And um, I'm going to ask one more question here. This is from Rachel. Um, Rachel is, is, is asking, um, to what extent can you see the image that, you're take, that, that you want to take as you're taking it? You know, or mm. is, is there a certain amount of luck with it i mean let, let, let's take for example that that beautiful image we were looking at that mm -hmm. i asked you to to show again of the of the 
of, of, of the butterfly. It was cowslip, wasn't it? Was that right? The, uh, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, it, cowslip, yeah. I mean, it, it, is that exactly what you expected it, how you expected it to come out? It, um, or, or, yes, or I mean, it, it, oh, you know, trial and error, and that, that's really surprised me. It, your starting point has to be something that's probably already in your head. Yeah. The end point probably won't be if you do it properly because you always respond to what you've got. As I say, the, the formulaic photography isn't of as much interest to me because it's not as fun. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be guaranteed a result when I go out with the camera. I want to have to try for it. And I want to be surprised by what I'm seeing when I look down the lens. Um, you know, the, the photography is and always has only been a way for me to learn more about the natural world. I'm not actually particularly interested in cameras. It's just a convenient tool for seeing everything with um and so that observation time through the lens is the real treasure you get from all of this you know to spend time in that meadow looking for these pictures is what it's all about i have a few compositional formulae though that get me started so yes of course i knew i wanted that sort of effect and i knew that to do that I'd be down at f2.8 or f4 or something like that to get the shallow depth of field that was the first decision and I also, obviously, I spotted the butterfly first and walked around to find an angle where I was absolutely parallel to it. Because if it had been slightly off parallel, I wouldn't have been able to get that rather striking contrast to the sharp butterfly and the hazy mm. out of focus surroundings. I do give a lot of time over, though, I mean, coming back to the real thrust of the question to, you know, having ideas. So you you have to um, spend time maybe looking at lots of really nice photos that inspire you. I send the majority of my professional work off to a really nice image library called Nature Picture Library. Um, and I'd recommend anybody have a look on there if you want to develop your ideas. And basically they've got endless galleries of beautiful wildlife images. And if you flick through them, maybe like one every two seconds, you kind of absorb the essence of each one just subtly. And you might not be able to write down what it is you like about a particular one, but these images come back to you when you're in the field at the strangest times. And it's your ideas factory, your repertoire that then allows you to respond to things there and then. Um, so I, I do think, you know, the, the picture maybe takes a two hundredth of a second, but the idea behind it, it might have taken a whole day. Yeah, it was one of the questions that, that, that came in is, you know, how long did it take to um, um, take one of those images? And, and, and I guess it's, you know, it, 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 it can be hours and it, or it can be an entire day if you're mm. visualising it that far ahead. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Hey, listen, Alex, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I, I, I genuinely, I could what watch that presentation again and again and again. I, to be honest, you could have kept on going all night and I've, I'd have been enthralled. So, so again, thank you very, very much for, uh, for, for joining us and, and for, okay. for putting such a lovely presentation together. I am now um, going to uh, run a poll, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Alex, Alex was talking about the, um, the, the trip that he co-leads with Nick Garbutt. Uh, and um, quite simply, we want to ask you, uh, the following question, um, which is, which is, would you like to receive uh, a travel plan for uh, the close up on Alpine Nature Tour? Um, it runs in the month of June. Um, the next available departure is the 18th of June 2022. So that's next June, the 18th of June 2022. The departure immediately before that is full. Um, we have uh, just a, we, that, that, that departure on the 18th of June has got about eight or so places on it. There's a maximum of 10 people um, uh, on, on these departures. We do have another departure scheduled uh, for the June of 2023, believe it or not. Uh, that is departing on the 17th of June 2023. So look at your diaries, look at your calendars. If you've got that week spare, in June 2023, then uh, believe me, uh, I think there's worse things in you can do than join Alex and Nick for, for a wonderful week, uh, just over a week, uh, based in those beautiful alpine um, wildflower meadows. What a, what a week that will be. 
really great. So thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. And, and clearly the lifetime that you have been going um, to and from Austria has, has, has generally paid off. You know, that it was uh, it was really, really wonderful. It's worth also mentioning, I think, isn't it, Alex? Um, I'm going to end that poll there. It is worth also mentioning that um, you're involved with a trip that uh, we run to Pembrokeshire, and that this is not what the, the, the presentation was about, I appreciate, but um, we do have a trip that is going to Pembrokeshire to do a coastal photo workshop, uh, and that's happening this September. So if you would like to uh, find out a bit more information about that particular trip, um, then the best thing to do is just to drop me a, a, a quick message on the uh, on, on the uh, Q and A session here or on the chat session here, and I'll be very happy to pass that information on to uh, our sales team, and then we can get some information to you about that. Uh, mm -hmm. That is this September uh, in Pembrokeshire, and with Nick Garber as well. It sounds like a great. Do you, do you want to mention the yeah, kind of you're doing I'll, on that? I'll very briefly outline it. I mean, obviously, the pandemic has caused all of us to look at what we've got at home um, and to be honest I hope that's a legacy that we keep that we are a bit more aware of how wonderful our home wildlife is um, as tour leaders we've been thinking well let's let's respond to all of this and let, let's see what we can do um, on these shores and actually I've been wanting to run a, a rock pool photography macro trip and coastal subjects for a long time um, and this has sort of really gave me the excuse to do it and I've done you know over the years an awful lot of um, photography at low tide where you've got all of these wonderful macro subjects such as sea anemones, corals, crabs, fish revealed briefly at low tide before it then all changes again so it's a good opportunity to get to understand things like off-camera flash, focus stacking but with some subjects that are you know in a relatively contained space and on that yeah. trip too we've also got a um, boat trip out to photograph seals um, that are puffing around then and obviously all the landscapes too so yeah. if that interests you there we go we've got there you that go, is yeah. an option um, a beautiful to, part of the UK you know it's stunning st it st is. stunning coastline there it really is and, and that that's with you and, and, and Nick so just, just worth mentioning it as an aside um, so as I say Drop, drop us a message on the question um, forum there on the chat forum or otherwise um, do get in touch with us at sales at wildlifeworldwide.com or give us a telephone call on 01962 302086. We do have a special offer um, to say thank you for joining us on uh, this particular presentation. If you would like to join the Austria trip, then there is that code there that you can use, A-U-A-H, Zoom. And that gives £100 per person off that particular trip. So if you want to make a new booking for, for that departure next June or in uh, June 2023, then, then, then use that code. Otherwise, um, I'm going to wrap up and say thank you again to Alex. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the next presentation uh, that we're going to be doing is going to be about Alaska. And that's going to be on Monday evening at 7.30. So do go to our website, uh, go to the events page, and sign up for that. That should be a cracker. Uh, and then um, next Wednesday, we've got a lovely lunchtime presentation, which is focusing on the birds and mammals of Colombia, another great trip that we run there too. So that really is it. Alex, uh, thank you again uh, from, what, from, from me and I'm sure from everybody here who joined us. I'm sure there's a big virtual round of applause going around the country for you. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I always say at the end of these uh, presentations, do stay safe, do look after each other, look after yourselves, and uh, we really do hope to see you again very, very soon. So thank you and good night. Night night, everybody.